So this is where we left off uh, last time when we were talking, remember we are talking acoustic emission and just uh, a quick review on acoustic emission. Uh, remember it's, it's very similar to ultrasound. We're looking at the, the waveform, the acoustic waveform that's coming off of a part. However, this is a, it's a passive technique. Uh, the, we aren't sending a signal into the part. We're purely listening for how it reacts when it's under stress, whether that's operational stress or typically operational stress. So this is one of, one of the passive forms that we looked at. Anyone remember what the other passive technique is? When I specifically call it a passive technique. So eddy currents, right? What, what are active techniques? Think, think about things we're gonna put something into a part. So what was the passive technique that, that we discussed? Anyone remember? We haven't even talked about geography yet. So thermography, infrared, is is one of is the other passive technique. So passive techniques are geography, or sorry, are thermography or infrared, and then acoustic emission, um, eddy current, ultrasound, uh, mag particle. You know, you're running a current through it. Those are all active techniques. Uh, even dye pen is kind of considered an active technique because you're applying the dye and then looking for the results. Whereas this, you are not the one applying the stress. It is the stress is being induced by the operation of the part, the object, the system. Question. So you are you are heating it, but you're not. If you're doing active thermography, you may heat or cool it, but it's not the heat you're putting in that you're picking back up, if that makes sense. The heat's going into the part. It's increasing the energy of the part. You're removing it from that excitation source. And then you're measuring it as it comes back out of the part. But it's, a, it's, it's not like the sound wave that gets sent in and it's that same sound wave coming back out. Or it's not the electromagnetic field that eddy current's doing, and then you're picking up the electromagnetic field that, that comes instantly back out. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're you're looking at how that object is changing temperature, not how the heat you actually put in is coming back out, even though you kind of can in a way. Uh, yeah, it's but we were talking about the, the parts of theory. So this is a passive technique and we're gonna measure those, those sound waves, those mechanical, sound is a mechanical wave. It's the motion of the atoms in the object. Um, and our, and our, our waveform, and I've, I've updated a couple of things here. So first of all, there are letters that go along with some of these different forms. So amplitude is typically referred to as A, R is rise time, D is duration. Counts and you know n is commonly used when you're counting something the number of times the number of pulses in your signal there. Um, and at the end, I was talking about the area or the energy underneath that curve. The term for that is Mars. It's M A R S E down here, and it's the measure of the area under the envelope. And what the envelope means of the recti the the envelope of the rectified curve. The rectified curve is if we take every pulse and we make it positive, right? Because the sound wave is going to have a positive negative pulse, right? So if we essentially do the absolute value, we take all these negative pulses, we flip them up. You can see the dash lines here. And you draw this line over top of them. That line forms what's called the envelope of the signal. And so the area that's underneath that, all that space underneath, gives us a measure of the energy in that pulse. And the term last time I forgot to include that on here. I kind of described what it was, but it wasn't great. So I wanted to retouch on that. Okay. So moving on from there, when we look at these signals, there's a lot of stuff that's similar to ultrasound. Um, and so the big thing here, wave signal, it's going to be prone to attenuation, which is where as that the the resistance, right, as that sound wave travels through a material it's going to encounter resistance to traveling, right? The material is going to, you're going to be pushing those atoms back and forth, but they are going to be pushing against that movement. And so over time or over distance, 
that signal amplitude, that signal strength is going to drop, and you're going to, and that's going to be your attenuation. It's going to be, you know, the the way we can think of it is the further away from somebody you are, the quieter they sound. Um, and so, you know, that's attenuation that we see, we hear in the in the in our hearing range, um, but it occurs at the at the um, all the different ranges, whether it's ultrasound or infrasound. You probably heard the term infrasound is below the range of hearing. With acoustic emission, we're picking up, we can pick up the ultrasound, we can pick up um, the audible sound range, we can pick up the infrasound, and depending on what we're looking for, we, you know, our signal of interest may cover one or more, or all of those areas. The other thing that happens is we have um, geometric spreading, and that is you can picture, you know, if you have, a, you can picture the sound as you have a certain amount of sound released, right? This is the ripples in a pond effect. So if I have a certain amount of sound released here, right, as that spreads out, that same amount of energy, actually that reducing energy, because it's going to attenuate, as it spreads out, that same amount of energy is going to get spread or is going to get spread over a bigger and bigger area, right? So it's not getting quieter because of the resistance of the material now, but it's just that that pulse as it, 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 that same pulse is being spread over a bigger area. And so that's that geometric spreading is you're gonna get a reduction in the intensity um, of, the, of the signal of the volume due to it being spread. And, and we're dealing with, you know, here I'm drawing it on a plane and on a plane, you get about a 30% decay for each doubling a distance. So from here to here, it drops by 30%. So now we're at about 70%, you know, from here to here, it drops another 30%, okay, which is 21. So now we're down to 49%, okay? From here to here, so we're, so, so two times the distance, or, or double this, you know, we've, we've cut the sound in half. From here to here, it drops another 30% to the original, right, 49. So it takes it down to 34% of the original signal. So you can see how that drops as you go. And that's, that's on a two-dimensional plane. If you're in a three-dimensional structure, now you're not just spreading that over an area, you're spreading it in all directions. And so the, the distance as you, as you move out, for each time you double that distance, it's a 50% decay, right? Because you're spreading it out over even more area. Okay. Um, the, we talked about, I, I mentioned the you know attenuation occurs because of the resistance of the material. That's referred to as the dampening, or damp. Sorry, damping, not dampening. Damping. Okay, don't confuse the terms. If you say dampening to a physics person or an engineer, they're going to slap you. I said it. My brother's an engineer, and I mentioned he's a suspension engineer specifically. And I said dampening one time, and I thought he was going to like. He, he just gave me this look like. Suspension damps vibration. It does not dampen vibration. I, I don't know. Whatever. Okay. So, yeah. So damping. And then finally, what's called wave scattering. And that is in a part, the geometry, right? Certain, we looked at this when you did ultrasound. You looked at um, performing ultrasound on a corrosion area or a piece where it wasn't, you know, where it's not homogeneous or not flat, right? You hit that, that that lumpy area where there's corrosion, the sound got scattered all over the place. And so a certain amount of the sound isn't gonna travel because it's gonna hit things like geometry in the part that's gonna cause it to bounce off into, off into the right, off into right field, off into left field. You know, it's not all gonna go where it needs to go. So those are all gonna cause that signal, that wave or that signal to be attenuated, to be smaller or less than what it was right at its source. And we can use that, it can work to our advantage or it can work to our disadvantage. Um, and, and we'll look at that when we look at how do we locate things within a part. Other things we have to contend with, parts, the world in general is noisy, right? We have machinery operating. If we're doing this on an aircraft and it's doing it in service, you got engines running, engines have vibration, right? They're putting out a certain amount of sound, a certain amount of mechanical vibration. Um, if you're doing it in other areas, and and it can be, you can see all these things. You got the wind, you, you know, the air, the air streams sliding over the fuselage makes a bunch of noise. A lot of the noise from an aircraft you hear 
Uh, when it's flying is purely from the air, the friction of the air running over the fuselage uh, or running through the engines. So you've got these undesirable signals that can be detected by the acoustic emission sensors. And so we have to take that into account or we have to filter that out. So we have to understand what is the signal, you know, what kind of a waveform are we looking for? We're looking for this wave. It might be buried in all kinds of other waves. You know, there might be other waves like this. And there might be another wave like this. Right? So now we got to filter out. We want to find just the signal we're looking for. So we got to have ways of identifying that. Okay. And so we need to know kind of what it is we're looking for. And we need to apply things to get rid of that noise. So other sources, things that we can have, you know, friction, wind, expansion, contraction, flex points, impact. Sometimes we look at impact. Sometimes impact is what we're looking for. I'll talk about that in the example at the end. But rain, right? If rain starts hitting the airplane, we don't want to think that the airplane's falling apart if there's a bunch of raindrops hitting it. Um, Wind-driven dust. You know, this is something to do with like bridges and that kind of thing, you know, out in the middle of, out in the middle of Nebraska or Iowa, you know, you're going to have that wind driven even around here. Um, and then the mechanical vibration, we've got hydraulic pumps, we've got fuel pumps, we've got engines, we've got air cycle machines, we've got all these things spinning and moving and vibrating, right, that, that are all normal. Um, and so we have to negate it. And so we're going to use something called an electronic, what I have here, an electronic gate or later on. I'll also refer to it as what's called a bandpass filter. And that is, it'll allow certain frequencies through, but those that are above or below are gonna be filtered out. And that's why it's called bandpass. It only lets a certain bandwidth of uh, frequency pass and it blocks the rest. Other things, physical distance, right? We can, the, if, if, we, if we put the sensors close to the areas we're monitoring, the natural attenuation of the object is going to reduce the sound of the engines, right? If we're looking at the wing spar and you have a, your typical wing mounted airliner, wing mounted engine airliner, and you're looking at the wing spar and the wing box right underneath the fuselage, you know, if you put the sensor out by the wing or out by the engine on the wing, it might pick up that wing box noise, but it's also gonna pick up a lot of engine noise. But if we locate the sensor right in the wing box in the area of interest, you're gonna have a lot less engine noise transferring in. It's gonna, the wing, structure itself is going to attenuate that engine noise moving through the structure into the wing box. And then other, there are other types of electronic filters that kind of goes in with the electronic gates. Um, things like signal arrival time or what's called spectral content. That's that, what I was talking about with all the different waves. What's our wave look like versus all the other waves out there? What's the wave of interest appear to be? compared to all the other waves that might be uh, hitting the object. What are we doing with them? So the general system is shown here, it's illustrated here. And, and the one thing I don't like, all the, all the images I see, for whatever reason, the stress or stimulus, they put the arrows pointing out. To me, it makes more sense that that stimulus would be going into the part, but every image I've got, it shows it pointing out. But, you know, again, the stress or stimulus typically is not something we're gonna be applying. Being a passive technique, it's going to be the stimulus, the stress from the operation of the object. And so that's going to go into the part and it's going to cause, there's going to be what's called the source. The source is what creates that acoustic emission wave. And so we have to find that source. We're going to sense it with a sensor. And then we're going to use different amplif amplifiers and filters in order to boost that signal and make it so that it's strong enough and clean enough that we can perform analysis on it. And then finally, we're gonna send it to some type of a system in order to analyze it. And that could be measuring it, it can be displaying it for, for you to see, uh, or storage and recording to be able to review later. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's real time or, 
for later analysis. And then, so simple versions of this could be something like an oscilloscope or a voltmeter. More common and what you're going to see nowadays would be a computer of some kind or a specialized processing device. So looking at it a little closer, here's, here's just kind of another image that shows the general setup of these. Again, the arrows are pointing out. I'm not sure why. I think they should point in for the stimulus. But source, sensor, pre-amplifier, you might have other filters and post-amplifiers and that kind of thing. And then you can see here how things might be displayed, um, whether they're bar graphs or line graphs. Uh, or the actual waveform itself being recorded down here. And then we can do different, you know, different techniques on it. So looking at the actual components, the, the deep down, the, the specific components we've got. First thing we've got are your sensors. And again, like I said, this is a very similar technique to ultrasound. And so the equipment, the sensors are, are very similar. You can see. These sensors here look like ultrasound probes. It's because effectively they are the same thing. In fact, the construction is almost basically identical. So they're, they're, they're a transducer and a reminder, a transducer is just that it's taking that mechanical motion of the wave and it turns it into an electrical signal and typically a voltage signal. So then we can look at the the frequency of that voltage signal and it's going to match the frequency of the sound signal you're just turning that signal from one form of energy to the other is what these transducers are going to do and the most common part type is piezoelectric crystals which is just like what all of our ultrasound transducers are the most common of those is a ceramic known as zirconate titanate it's a titanium based ceramic and remember, a, it's a semiconductor material, okay? And when it's vibrated, when you, when it, when a vibration hits it, it produces a voltage. And ultrasound, remember we did it the other way. We sent an electric signal to it that created a sound wave, a pulse or motion. And then we would pick it up either with a second crystal or with the same crystal that's swapping back and forth between projecting and listening. In this case, these sensors, the, the acoustic emission sensors, are only going to be listening. They're never sending a signal in. As soon as you do, as soon as you would, if you did send a signal out, now you're no longer doing acoustic emission. Now you're doing ultrasonic testing or, or sound testing of some kind. Um, these work in a, you can get them in all kinds of frequency emission can be performed in any range keep that in mind it can be performed in infrasound that's too low to hear that's the stuff you feel in the pit of your stomach it can be performed in the audible range okay up to twenty thousand hertz most common it's done in the it's also done in the ultrasonic range because there's less interference in the ultrasonic range. There's less um, extraneous noise typically in the ultrasonic range. And so that's in that 30 kilohertz, which is, which is 10,000 hertz above what we can hear. And even all of us standing here, I doubt most of you can even hear up to 20,000 hertz anymore. Okay, young kids can hear up to 20,000 hertz, and as you age, your ears go lower, especially if you're one who likes to go to concerts or play with loud motorcycles or do stuff like that. <laughs> so, so, you know, mine, mine has dropped off. I've played with loud APUs enough that, and, and jet engines that it's caused some high end, you know, it's your, where you're hearing protection. Um, but, you know, up to one megahertz. Now, a lot of your ultrasound, it's common in ultrasound to go above, remember to go above one megahertz. So if you're doing ultrasonic testing, you may go, you know, higher than that. But this is the most common operating frequency and range for acoustic emission. And these can be fixed or portable systems, okay? Fixed means they're installed in place, they're left there, and they're used for continuous Or when we want to perform an inspection, we do the inspection, but then the, the equipment would be removed after. And here's just a breakdown of it. So. Just to review, it's going to be enclosed in a case. 
we're going to have some kind of a damping material at the top because we don't care about sound coming from the outside, right? We don't we don't want sound waves coming in this way. Here's our sound wave, right? This this doesn't mean anything. Our our sample our material is down here, so that damping material is going to try to get rid of any sound waves that are coming from the wrong direction, from the areas we don't care about. Okay, that's one of those ways of reducing the extraneous noise. Then you've got your piezoelectric element. In this case, they show a wear plate because this basically is a is an ultrasonic tester. And then the couplet material. Now, in ultrasonic testing, we use the gel. Any ideas? What do you think we use with these kind of systems? Do you think you always use the gel? It's, what applications do you think you use an ultrasonic gel? Well, even a smooth surface, you got to couple it somehow. I'm talking more like fixed or portable there. What would you use the gel for? The portable, right? You're going to remove it. You're probably going to use some kind of a gel or a temporary, you know, it could be like um, a contact cement, you know, familiar with rubber cement, right? That, that can be, that can act as a coupling compound. What do you think our coupling is? What do you think our coupling compound is in a fixed system? Any ideas what that might be? What do you think would be a coupling in a fixed system? I'm seeing, I'm seeing arms going up like this. How do you think these sensors are mounted in a fixed system? What do you, what do you think they would be? What do you think is the most common way of mounting? And you know, I don't have my chat open. I'll see in case anyone's chatting. No. Any ideas? The what? A rubber mount? Rubber is probably going to attenuate the signal. That's going to drop it down. So we probably don't want to use rubber. But it, you're on the right track. So typically, these are going to be epoxied in place. There are certain epoxies that are designed to be, to have minimal attenuating property. They're designed to transmit sound. And so they'll, you'll, use a, it's a, you'll use an epoxy or a potting compound, and that will serve to hold the sensors in position, and it will serve as your coupling. So we've used, you know, we've used these sensors to acquire the signal. And a lot of times these signals can be very weak, right? They're even, even if it's a loud pop down in the, uh, the spar, by the time it travels, it's going to attenuate. Remember those, there, there can be a significant amount of attenuation, the, the signal drop. And so now we need to bump that signal up. And, and it's broken down into three basic areas. Sometimes these are integral, sometimes they're combined. But the first stage we have is what's called a preamplifier. And a preamplifier is it takes the signal and basically it injects more energy into it to make it stronger, to give it a greater amplitude. But it gives the entire signal a greater amplitude. Okay, so even the, you know, the weak stuff still weak, the, the strong portions of the signal are still strong. It just takes the whole signal and makes it stronger. Okay, and it boosts the energy. A preamplifier is your raw signal. So it increases that gain. That's known as the signal gain, right? We've talked about gain and, and using gain. This is that same amplifier setting that you have on ultrasonic equipment. It's the same amplifier type setup that you have on um, eddy current equipment is that the gain is the amount of power you know, you're adding to the signal to boost it, to make it louder, to make it easier to hear. And so this is typically placed, the preamplifier we want as okay. And in a lot of cases nowadays, the preamplifier on a lot of these systems, especially if it's spread out over say the whole area of an aircraft, you know, throughout the wing, they put preamplifiers in the sensor in the transducer. So the signal goes into the transducer and then it gets boosted before it gets sent out on the wire out to out to the rest of the system. 
out to the filters, main amplifiers, measurement, whatever else it might be. Okay. Then we need to, so that boosts everything. The preamplifier is going to include any extraneous signals, anything, even stuff we don't want. Okay. <clears throat> now there's a certain, there is a certain amount too. Just understand, you know, the sensors are, you know, with an operating frequency, they're, they're going to provide a certain amount of filtering. If you have, you know, a sensor that operates in, say, the 30 to 300 kilohertz range, it's not going to pick up the stuff below that. It's not even going to pick up stuff above that. But the signal we want may end up in the 40 to 45 kilohertz range, right? So now we're picking up 30 to 100, for example, and we're interested in 40 to 45. Now we got to get rid of that 30 to 40 and that 45 to 100. So that's the next stage. That's the filtering stage. It's going to eliminate any frequencies above or below our target frequency. And that's that band pass filter I was talking about. Okay. So it allows a certain band, say, say our area of interest is that 5,000 per. So it allows that to pass. Well, it filters out anything below it and filters out anything above it. Okay. And in the amplified signal, then we're going to take that filtered signal. And a lot of times we need to boost it even more before we perform any analysis to get an even stronger signal out of it. And so then we go to an amplifier or a main amplifier. Sometimes it's called a post amplifier. And that's going to boost the clean signal to the point where we can now perform accurate analysis and measurement on it. And that brings us to the next step, which is analysis. And so, as I mentioned earlier, most basic forms are voltmeters and oscilloscopes. There are cases where these, you can basically be looking at a voltmeter and, a, and, and voltmeters come in two basic forms. Anyway, what's the two basic forms? Remember? What's that? Digital and analog. Which one, if you're looking at, if you're trying to analyze an AC signal, which one do you think works better for that? What? You say digital, you say analog. Why? Why? Okay, so that's giving you kind of an average. Okay, so okay, why do you say analog? Because you said the opposite. Because you can see it bounce around. So actually, it, it's both. If you're trying to look at like. Is the signal getting bigger and getting smaller? An analog meter works really well. Because you can see that needle, that, that needle deflecting a little bit and then starts deflecting more and more and then it starts to deflect less and less. If you actually need to measure it, you're probably gonna be able to measure it better or get a total energy using a digital meter. Okay, so they're both good, but it just depends on what your goal is, okay? An oscilloscope then allows you to actually see that wave signal over time. You know, that's what that wave signal I showed here. This is what you would see essentially on your oscilloscope. Right. And so now you might be able to recognize a certain shape. You know, a certain wave shape, a certain wave form. To know, uh oh, we've got a problem or oh, that's just background noise. That's normal. OK, so that's the that's kind of the oscilloscope view. That's the most basic form. Do you think that's our most common form? Considering this technique was developed in the last 10 to 15, maybe 20 years, do you think voltmeters and oscilloscopes are the main way we do this? No. Neither. Computers, right? Computers are so cheap nowadays. You know, you could dollar computer in your pocket that can probably do the analysis basic analysis of this right your cell phone I, I wouldn't doubt if there's ways to you know utilize it. or a laptop or a specific built computer right now as soon as you throw aviation in front of it you had a bunch of zeros we we had a laptop designed for it ran windows uh, windows 2000 when I worked at the airline, that was used to upgrade the, the FADEC computers. It was this old 
really slow laptop running Windows 2000. It was a little newer than Windows 95, but it's what we would upgrade the FedEx. It was $60,000. And it was basically a laptop in a rubberized case running Windows 2000. Huh? Just a few years ago. 2000. Huh? They might have upgraded by now, but you know, it was, they were they ran anywhere from sixty to eighty thousand dollars because it's it was certified to work with the engine, and you were doing an upgrade to the FADEC, the full authority digital control. You know, there's a lot of liability there, so you paid a heck of a lot of money for a computer that was basically a, a really slow, really low capability computer. But it was plenty. It's plenty to do a lot of this kind of analysis. So you know, today pretty much everything is done computer based. And whether it's a laptop or a PC running, you know, or other specialized interface device, or a specialized computer, you know, and when I say a specialized computer, now we're getting into this into the fixed one. What do the computers look like in an airplane, in an airliner? Who's been in the avionics bay? What do, what do you see? What are all the computers? They're a bunch of black boxes, right? Well, those are computers and you can get, you know, this same type of computing equipment can be built into one of those, you know, black boxes that plugs into the avionics bay. And so that can be for a specialized fixed system. It's a computer designed to do this, but at its heart, it's really just a basic wave analysis computer. It's a fancy oscilloscope. But the really cool part then is these fixed systems can provide real time continuous monitoring and indication. And so now you can start to apply it to a lot of neat areas to be able to see what's going on with the aircraft, whether it's during the R and D and testing phase or over the life cycle of the aircraft or the life cycle, whatever it is, the bridge or the spaceship or you know whatever the vehicle the train tracks the railroad stuff the you know who knows There's, this has applications all over the place just like any other form of NDP. and so with that continuous monitoring you can that data can be sent to you know an, it can be sent to reliability centers for the aircraft manufacturer for the tied into an icast system in case you need to you want to have indication in the flight deck uh, you know, it's the the it's got a lot of possibilities. But what becomes important is this: these systems, they 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 typically are used as a thing to say, okay, there's a problem. Now we need to deploy the resources to find it, to to find and measure it. You know, with acoustic emission, if you get a pop in a wing spar, it means it means maybe it cracked, but we don't know. You might be able to get some idea of how big the crack is based on the energy, right? The Mars, the area under that curve. But you're not going to know exactly how many thousandths of an inch it is. Okay, this isn't that exact of a science yet. Maybe someday it will be. This, this, the technology is advancing really fast. Maybe someday they will be able to with the right algorithms and that kind of thing. But we want to try to find, at the very least, a source. We need to know what just happened and where do we need to look for the problem, you know, more detail. What do we need to open up? What areas do we need to access? And what kind of additional tests need to be performed? And so that's easiest in homogeneous or regular shaped structures, right? A square aluminum block or a rectangular aluminum block, if we crack it, we can probably tell by speed of sound how far away it was and you know that kind of thing. Once we start getting in of shapes or they're non-homogeneous, things like composites, right? Where you have a, a base, a matrix material, and then your and then your resin, or where parts are not where parts are connected, they're gonna have some acoustic bonding, but it's not gonna be a perfect transfer of sound between part A and part B when they're riveted together or bolted together, or if they're those irregular shapes, right? Those are gonna cause all kinds of strange, right? They cause scattering of the sound, or it's gonna transfer through one area faster than the other. It makes it a lot harder to pinpoint these sources, but they're coming up with ways of doing it. And the methods, there's three primary methods used for location, for finding the location of your 
damage or whatever it was occurred. And depending on what you're looking at finding, you may use one, two, or all three of these methods uh, in, in the way this system's deployed. So the first here is our rectangular block I was talking about. And in this case, we're gonna use, this is the linear method. And the linear method is, it relies on two sensors. And basically you have a line between the two sensors. And if there's a failure along that line, or if there's a failure, it doesn't have to be right along the line, right? This is still, this could be a three dimensional part. You know, if we look at it in a top view, maybe it's wider like this, right? Okay, and we've got sensor over here, right? That's kind of the top view. So, you know, they show a, uh, AE source, an acoustic emission source right here. So we'll say that's here, okay? Or it could be here, 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 right? So we can figure out that it's some distance between these two sensors based on the arrival time, okay? In this case, the sound is going to arrive at the left-hand sensor before it arrives at the right-hand sensor. But it'll tell us there was a failure. It'll say it was this far between, but it can't tell us, is it close to this edge? Is it close to this edge or was it directly in the middle? right? So it can tell us at some distance, but it, it, it's not going to give us, it's a single dimension. You know, it'll tell us a single dimension of, of where something is, an X, an X dimension. Okay, and based on that difference in time that it takes, you know, between when one sensor senses it to the other one, we can figure out where it is on that linear dimension. But we can't figure out which, you know, in this case, we can figure out which way it is X in the X dimension. We can't figure out which way it is here, Y. Or, you know, at the same time, is it near the top surface or, right? It's not gonna tell us that. Okay. So that's linear. But now, if we do need to do an inspection, we can say, okay, you know, we need to inspect this area, we don't need to pull the panels on this area, right? Maybe, again, maybe it's a wing spar, it runs through. You know, think about how wide the fuselage is on our 727. You know, do you wanna pull all the panels from left to right, or do you just wanna pull a couple panels in the left-hand wheel well? Right, it gives us a little bit better idea of where to look. The next method is called zonal, and this can be a two-dimensional or three-dimensional array. The picture, the illustration I have here is a two-dimensional array. Uh, and this is used, zonal is used in materials with high attenuation. What does high attenuation mean? What does high attenuation mean? If a material has high attenuation, does sound travel easily through it or does it resist the, tra the sound traveling through it? It resists. Attenuation is reduction in signal. So the more resistance there is, the more attenuation it is. So a high attenuation material. So what the idea here is, is materials with high attenuation is you put out a grid or a, a, an array, a matrix of sensors, and they can be two-dimensional, they can be three-dimensional, but they're spaced far enough apart that if a sound happens in one grid section, it's probably only gonna be effectively picked up by a single sensor. So if we have a failure here, It'll be picked up by sensor one, but it's far enough away that the signal will be too small to be relevant by the time that signal gets to sensors three, four, two, or especially five, seven, six, six, seven, five, six, or seven. There we go, five, six, seven, <laughs> right? So the, the idea is the sound basically can accurately be detected 
the distance from this dot to one of the edges of these cells. Okay, or from my, maybe I should say X marks the spot instead of dot, because there's already dots. So if that's my failure point, it's only in this case gonna get picked up by sensor one. So what this tells us, what is this, I guess what sh I should ask you, what does this tell us? Does it pinpoint a specific location? It gives you a zone, right? Now we know a zone we have to look in. We don't have to look in zones two, three, four, five, six, or seven, but we don't know exactly where it is in zone one. Okay, so that's, that's zonal, hence the term, you find something in a zone. But I don't know if it's here in zone one, I don't know if it's over here in zone one. I don't know if it's up here in zone one, right? It could be any of those points and it gets picked up by that sensor. Because we're not sending the signal out, we don't know how long it took, you know, whether it's here or way out here, we don't know how long it was from when that sound was created until it hit the sensor. We just know the sensor picked up a sound. And we don't know how big of a crack or a failure it was because it could be a small failure close to the sensor. That's gonna sound probably just as loud as a big failure that's far away, right? So I got my little X close. I put a big X farther away. They might sound the same by the time they get to the sensor. So we have no way of knowing is it close to the sensor or is it far away? You know, we don't know how long it took to get to the sensor. All we know is it got picked up by that sensor. It couldn't be picked up by any of the others. So it's gotta be in that zone somewhere. If we take that to the next, an, another kind of matrix-based point, a sensor array, is what's called the source location method. And in source location methods, in this case, now we're doing stuff with low material. We just talked about high attenuation, what's low? Low means? Easy, sound transmits easily through it or more easily, okay? And so in this case now, it's not logical to expect the sensors to be spread. You know, we basically, you know, if you have multiple sensors on a piece of metal, you know, think about, maybe you have, maybe if any of you put your ear to a railroad track to listen for a train coming, you can hear the train way, 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 way off in the distance. You put your head, I'm not recommending you go out and put your head down on a set of railroad tracks, but. <laughs> So, or in water, sound travels really far in water. There we go, right? You can hear, you can hear like a, if you've ever been snorkeling, you can hear boats going way overhead, you can hear ships from far away. Um, the, in this case, we, we couldn't even, if we wanted to, we couldn't even put the sensors far enough apart. But what it, now it allows us to do is we take that same, that same thing we had where we had the linear sensors, right? We could, we could figure out how far it was between, you know, the distance, the relative distance between two sensors. But now we can take that with three sensors or four sensors and we can start to actually pinpoint it in space. And so materials of low attenuation, we have multiple sensors with the expectation that we're gonna receive the signal at multiple sensors, maybe all the sensors, who knows? I don't know how many all the sensors is, but you know, the more sensors there. If we have two, we get that linear determination, you know, like we did here, our source, our linear two sensors. If we have three, we can now determine a location on a plane, right, a flat, an XY plane. And if we can pick it up with four, now we can do a volumetric. That's a three-dimensional point in space. We can figure out where a failure is occurring. So it allows us to do that. And we do that by basically just measuring the difference in arrival time. So it's kind of illustrated a couple ways here, right? If we have a source right here, it's gonna take a certain amount of time to get to sensor one, right? But if it's sensor one, we don't know, you know, you, you, you don't know, but now you got sensor two involved and sensor three, and now we can triangulate that point right there. This is how GPS works. Your phone and the GP, the, your phone basically senses the difference in time from signals from different satellites. And based on where those satellites are, it can tell where it is in, on the surface of the earth. This is the same thing with sound. Okay, you, have, you have satellites, they all have, they all have a set time. They send out a ping at the exact same time and you get ping, 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 ping from a bunch of different satellites hit your phone. It says, okay, I got 
you know, time from this one, time from this one, time from this one, and it can triangulate and figure out the position. And so if you have three sensors, you can find it on a flat plane. But if I was to flip this up, if I was to take it and put it in, know if that source was above or below those three sensors, right? I just know it's somewhere in that plane. If I had a fourth sensor, now I know if it's above or below and how far. So here on the right there, it's showing this is how then the triangulate, triangulation takes place. You know, sensor one says, you know, it took this amount of time. It can be anywhere on this circle. Sensor two says it can be anywhere on this circle. Sensor three says it can be anywhere on this circle. Those circles only intersect at one point. That's where our source has to be. Okay, that's triangulation. And you add a fourth, and now you can get it in three dimensions instead of just two. And it can be, you can actually take this. This is in a flat plane, a homogeneous structure. But if you have a complex structure, like aircraft structure, equations can be derived that can provide this in geometrically complex parts. You know, if you have an L-shaped, where'd my mouse go? If you have an L-shaped structure, right? And say I have a sensor right here, you know, and I have a sensor here, and I have a sensor here, it's going to take longest, you know, if there's something going on here, it's going to take longest to get up to this one over here. It's going to be relatively short here, right? And and using we can take into account that that geometry that's taking place and be able to pinpoint locations. Uh, yeah, you know where you have to know where the probes are placed on the object. You know, well, when they when they engineer the system, they'll figure out where they have to be placed in order to give you that accurate. Thing. Especially if it's something that involves having these equations to figure out stuff. Okay. Last part, part: aerospace applications. I know we're running over a couple minutes, but um, permanently attached. Our monitor used to monitor hard to access structures, so things like wing spars, trunnions, which is where the landing gears mount, engine mounts. These are just some areas that they're starting to use this stuff. And this can be actively done, right? It can be real time in the aircraft. Impact detection was first used after the um, shuttle Columbia disintegrated on re entry. And now they can use it for things like bird strike or other impact detection. You can, you can get the sound of something or the, the, Birds or other objects make certain noises when they hit. And you can figure out that something's happened. Or in the case of the shuttles, it was chunks of foam off the orange tank. Fan blades, big one, right? The Boeing, the 777 fan blades. This could be a potential application on fan. On fluid flow and leakage, we can monitor things, either fixed or portable, things for leaks, oxygen leaks fluid flow through hydraulic systems, fuel flow. We actually had an instrument like this when we did um, actuator health checks, seal health checks, internal leakage checks, is fluid leaking past seals and valves and, and actuators. We actually had ultrasonic sensors that would clip to the side of the hydraulic lines while we were running it in the hangar, and they, could, they would measure the fluid flow using sound. So the old technique was you had to undo the hydraulic lines, install a little paddle wheel type flow mechanism, bleed the whole system, get the air out of the system, run it, you know, refill it if, it if you lost fluid. And it took longer to set it up and tear it down than to take the actual reading. New, it's a, it was an ultrasonic flow, uh, ultrasonic flow measurement unit. They're very expensive, but they save a lot of time. And they reduce, you know, now you start breaking into a system to put paddle wheels and other flow sensors in. You have the potential for something not getting put back together correctly, for inducing leaks at the fittings and all things like that. These, you pull the kit out. It's got a bunch of these sensors on wires. You put the ultrasonic gel on the face of them, and they got little clips that clip over the hydraulic lines. 
You fire the system up and you measure the flow just based on the sound of the fluid running through the lines. They had different size clips, you know, depending on for different. Pretty cool. It's a pretty cool system. Be neat to have one to show, but they, like you said, they sound expensive. So, you know, and, and that's a portable. It wasn't on the aircraft all the time. It was in maintenance. We, we attached them in the wheel well. That's the other thing. We, all the hydraulic lines ran through the wheel well. We were able to put them in the wheel wells really easily. We didn't have to open a bunch of panels and do everything else. And we could figure out if like an elevator or aileron actuator was leaking, if a valve was leaking based on, you know, if, if the seals start to go bad, you'll get more flow than what you should normally have. 